Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, I'm Debbie. I'm an alcoholic. I want to thank Becky and Jack and... Mark and his friend Sue, everybody, for making me feel welcome and for the honor of being able to come here and share with you guys tonight. Um, I love Alcoholics Anonymous, and if you're new to the program, welcome home. I hope you find what I found in this program, and it's given me a purpose, and it's given me peace of mind, and it enabled me to find a power greater than myself that will solve my problems and meetings to go to when I forget. Um, I never felt like I fit in my whole life. Um, I'm one of five kids, and I grew up back in Ohio, and there was a lot of alcoholism in my family tree, but I don't blame my alcoholism on my parents, grandparents, or anybody else. I love in the big book where it talks about um, we drink because we like the effect produced from alcohol, and it's like I loved it. I loved it ever since I was a little kid, and I was... um, I was always kind of worshiping my dad. I love my dad. He was my higher power when I was a little kid, and I looked up to him, and I would follow him around, and on the weekends, um, he would do some projects, and so one Saturday, we were working in the basement, and there was a pool table in a rec room, and um, I didn't know what we were doing, but I was handing him tools, and what he was doing was um, drilling a hole in the side of the spare refrigerator to put a keg. <laughs> I love my dad. <laughs> but anyway, I, uh, it was a nice way to be able to help yourself to alcohol <laughs> as a teenager, and, and actually before I was a teenager, but I, I would always um, steal alcohol from my parents, and then when I got to be a teenager, I ran with this neighborhood gang, and and we just, we were pretty harmless, but we would get their older siblings to buy us alcohol, and, and we would drive around in the country roads in Ohio and watch the guys drag race, and we would drink and throw up in the cornfields and smoke pot. <laughs> Smoked a lot of pot. Actually, I got the nickname Doobie in high school. <laughs> yeah. Kind of proud of that, <laughs> but <laughs> I could roll a joint with one hand and drive a stick. <laughs> and so, anyway, <laughs> you know, you never know when that's going to help you. When I went to England in sobriety, I could drive on the other side of the road. I thought I have done this, but anyway, so <laughs> it depends on how you handle a car. But anyway, so it was. Um, It was a lot of fun. You know, alcohol and stuff didn't cause me a lot of problems at that time, and it was how I felt comfortable in my own skin, and I never felt a part of, and it didn't matter whether we were in crowds of people or with family or neighbors or whatever. I always felt less than, like, everyone got the instruction book but me, and I didn't quite know how to do that. And so when I was drinking and smoking pot, it just took all of that away, and I could have fun and laugh and and feel a part of, and I sought that feeling as often as I could. And I got pretty good grades in high school, but I fought with my mom especially all the time. And we were like two cats in a bag, you know, and I was I was so much like her is why I know now. And um, and my sneaking out to drink and coming home at night, and I thought she was in bed, you know, and I'd be sneaking around the corner to go upstairs, and she'd be in the living room with it dark, and she'd take a drag off her cigarette, and I'd be like, <laughs> I got two more weeks, you know, I <laughs> got two more weeks being grounded. But anyway, I just like, at infinitum, I was always grounded, and then I'd do something to get me two more weeks but I just, I caused her so much anxiety and stuff, and I didn't care. I just was thinking about myself, and that's that selfish self-centeredness. And I um, I ran with that neighborhood gang as often as I could, and, and I decided that my parents wanted me to go to college right away, and I just wasn't up for it. I wanted to leave and move to California. I thought then I'd be happy. And there were some neighborhood, um, three brothers that lived down the street from me, and both their parents passed away, and so they were going to move to California a year before I graduated, and they said, why don't you come out there? So after I graduated, my girlfriend and I left Ohio to move out there, and I didn't know what I was doing. I was 18 years old, and she got homesick before we got out of Ohio, and I thought, this is not good. (laughs) But it's my car, so there's no going back. And so anyway, she stayed for three months and then flew home, but 
I just stayed in, and I'm grateful now because I love the Alcoholics Anonymous in San Diego County, and and it's it turned out to be a good life for me. And I I know you can get sober anywhere, and and it's the perfect place for wherever you're at. But um, I love my home group in in Carlsbad, California, and and the meetings that I go to. But um, when I left and moved out to California, I thought I was going to be happy. And I didn't realize that I was taking the problem with me. And when I got there and I started, um, I started working. I sold carpet for a little while and waitressed and started bugging this engineering firm to hire me. It was the only drafting job in the in the newspaper. And I had taken drafting in high school and I wanted to be an architect. And then when I started working for them, um, they were civil engineers and I loved it. And so I switched and started going to school to be a land surveyor at night. And it took me 10 years to get a two-year degree. I'm like, easy does, it's always my motto. But I'm like... <laughs> <laughs> you got to pace yourself when you drink. But anyway, I am <laughs> one class a semester forever. <laughs> but I was going to school at night to do that and working in the daytime, and they were a lot of fun, nice guys to work with, and they had big sign survey party. Love that. <laughs> and so anyway, we always had things to do after work and drink in bars and that kind of stuff. And and I for a while, I couldn't even drink in the bars because in California, you had to be 21. In Ohio, you can drink at 18, and I think they know you need a little head start. <laughs> but anyway, I... Um, I went back to asking people to buy me alcohol again, and I didn't like that feeling, but I, I needed alcohol. It's what made me feel comfortable in my skin. And my alcoholism didn't progress for uh, several years. I just drank every day you know, after work and got up and was on time for work and earned my day's pay and went home at night. And, and it just, it, it wasn't progressing a lot, but I, I certainly needed and looked forward to it every night. It was my reward for working hard all day. And then I was going to school some nights and, and, um, it was just kind of boring really. And then I found this neighborhood gal and it's like water seeks its own level. And Susan partied the way I did. And so we started drinking together after work at night and she had, she was a single mom. And when she didn't have her son, we would get together and drink in the evenings. And, and she said the reason why we were so unhappy was because we didn't have a hobby. And I thought, well, you could be right, you know? So she goes, we're going to go deep sea fishing this weekend. And I go, okay. <laughs> so we got up early and we went down to the Oceanside Harbor and we had our coolers, you know, full of beer. And um, <laughs> it was like, we didn't have poles. <laughs> but anyway, so... <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> but anyway, so we went on this charter boat, and it's a good thing you can rent poles, you know, handy. And so um, we were trolling for other things anyway. But anyway, so <laughs> it's like we, we had the best time. And I it's funny because I was telling um, a friend of mine that I've, I charter fishing trips for my coworkers now a few times, and so we're going in two weeks, but we really go for fish. But anyway, so we um, – so – we went fishing that day, and we rented poles, and we found the guys on the boat that partied the way we did, and we got drunk, and it was just, you know, and I loved it. They encourage you right from the get-go. If you get sick, you just throw up over the railing. I thought, how handy, and you can blame it on the water. <laughs> it's, like, so good. Anyway, and so I loved it, and we had fun, and I met this guy on the boat, and within a week and a half, I had moved him in with me, and I... Um, I joke he was my catch of the day. He was an unemployed contractor, IV drug user, alcoholic. <laughs> Yay. <And> so, <laughs> I'm like, wow. Anyway, so <laughs> now I go for fish. <laughs> so <laughs> um, anyway, but we, you know, we had this insane relationship for about a year and a half. And it was crazy because that was so against the, the values, not only that I was raised with, but my own. I mean, my parents didn't cram it down my throat. I just, I wanted to live the way they raised us to live. And it's like that went against everything. But, you know, getting sober and doing inventories and looking back, I realized that I had spent so much of my life comparing my insides to other people's outsides. And I thought the reason why my three sisters and my brother were happy back in Ohio was because they were married and having kids and building houses out in the country. And, and then it must be that's why, you know, I'm dying of loneliness. And it must be I need to get him. So I had him, and he was just a lot of work. Anyway, because, <laughs> you know, when they don't come home at night, you got to go find them. And so I'm like, you know, it's an Al-Anon right there. You know, I'm driving around Vista 
trying to find him in bars, and then I started drinking with him in Ken's Pub, and it was one of those bars where you definitely feel comfortable because they have the old toilet seats in the backyard, you know, with no lids. Anyway, and then big spools that electrical wire came on, and so those are the table and chairs, and you drink there, and, you know, it just was a seedy place, but I didn't have to worry about how I felt and what you guys thought of me and what those people thought of me, and I, it was like... Um, the, the feeling that I had was that I was better than because Terry was an IV drug user too and I would catch him shooting up in the bathroom and throw a screaming fit and all this stuff and at least I don't do that. That's the kind of thinking I had, well at least I'm not like that. Never looking at my own alcoholism or smoking pot or whatever but it's like that's better than shooting up and then of course when I started snorting some stuff, well at least I don't have needles, you know. And so I always changed the grades so that I could feel better about what I was doing and not and he was like my own little lower companion. You know, it takes the heat off. Anyway, and so we did that insane relationship for a year and a half. And I, I got this habit of getting resentments and going to Home Depot and getting deadbolts. And so I would change out the locks. You know, I can change a deadbolt so fast. Anyway, so... Um, you, you do it enough, you know, like start a business. But anyway, so I would do that, and then I'd put the old one in the shoebox and smoke a cigarette and drink a beer and wait for him to come home with the curtains closed and his key wouldn't work, <laughs> you know. And then, <laughs> and then go to bed, and the next day, you know, keep coming back. <laughs> it's like anyway, so <laughs> give him a key, you know. Anyway, and so I just it went on and on, and so. And then he wouldn't come home at night. I go to Home Depot. Anyway, it was just, it was insanity. And it, I'm so grateful because of this program that all that stuff is funny now. But at the time, it was just absolute insanity. And I had that whole Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde thing going because I was, you know, wearing dresses and going to work at this engineering firm. And I was a draftsman. And I'd get there early and make coffee for the surveyors and, and get the thing all set up and going. And and worked hard all day, and then at night I was this crazy maniac driving around Vista trying to find him if he wouldn't come home. And I had this great Dane German Shepherd, and I'd put him in the car, and sometimes I'd put on my pajamas because I knew by the time I got home it'd be late and I have to get up and I have to be on time, put clothes over that, grab a six-pack, God knows how long it's going to take to find him, and then a pack of cigarettes, piece of gum in case I got pulled over because I am a Girl Scout. Anyway, and so I am like, you know, I had it all planned out, and so I got the great Dane in the back. We're driving all over and I'm just full of resentment. Thank God we didn't have cell phones then because I'd have been calling everybody. But I just, it was crazy, crazy life. And then I'd go to work in the day and be this totally different person. And then after a while, those two lives started overlapping. And I was showing up at work, even though I was on time, I was reeking of alcohol. And sometimes the surveyors would come up to me and say, Deb, you might want to brush your teeth again. You smell like alcohol. And I was so embarrassed. I'd go in the bathroom and brush my teeth again, but I didn't realize it was just coming out my pores. And I didn't think I was an alcoholic because alcoholics drink in the morning. And if you're drinking in the morning, but you're still up from last night, that is last night. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> to me. <laughs> so anyway. <laughs> I didn't want to be one of those drinkers. And so I had all these things in my mind of what alcoholic was, even though I grew up with alcoholism in my family and watched what that did and that kind of stuff. And I swore I was never going to be like that, and I was just like that. And so I was doing more and more drugs with him, and then I finally kicked him out for the last time. And I moved into this little guest cottage, and it was 500 square feet, and it was up this um, steep driveway to the landlord's house, and then behind it, there was a little three-car garage, and I was above that. And so when I moved in that place, I was so paranoid. It was like I thought people were looking in the windows so I wouldn't leave the lights on. You know, I would drink in the dark because I thought people were, you know, watching me, you know, tall people. <laughs> and so anyway... <laughs> You know how they are. And so I would drink it, but then I had these little lace curtains, and I realized that when I smoked, because I smoked then, that you could see my face like my mom in the living room. So I realized I have to drink on the kitchen floor, and it's hard to get up. It's really, it's hard to get up. Anyway, and so 
that's where my alcoholism had taken me. In those last two months, I'm falling, trying to get up from the kitchen floor to get to the bathroom in a little tiny place, and I'm hitting the walls, and I fell sideways into the bathtub, and I couldn't figure out how to get out. And that's where alcoholism had taken me, and I was in my mid-20s. And it's like I was dying of alcoholism, but I my house was clean, plants were polished, you know what I mean? Visa bill was paid, everything I just... Everything, because I was neurotic, that's <laughs> what it was. But anyway, I, everything looked good, you know, but I was dying on the inside, you know. And that unmanageability part in the big book, you know, in the steps, I thought it was, well, if you lost your job, because I heard people lost their job and their spouse and, and all these other things. Well, I, you know, I didn't have a home to lose. I didn't have a spouse, so I didn't lose them. And, and I had all these reasons why I wasn't quite so bad, but I had lost everything on the inside and I had that gut-wrenching loneliness and I was crying all the time and making those drunken phone calls and I had um, one time I was um, driving drunk yet again and I did that all the time and I thank God I never killed anybody because I drove drunk all the time and I had blackouts all the time and you know I found it handy to close one eye because you keep your eye on that stripe and it just really helps and then you know hang one leg out of the bed and it slows it down and just you know you kind of cope. Anyway, and I was going home, and I got picked up for drunk driving, and the cop was super nice to me, and they took me to jail, though, and I cried, and I made a little bit of a scene. <laughs> I got my own cell, <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> they were nice to me, but anyway, <laughs> and cigarettes, <laughs> and so anyway, so I got my own cell, and I got to go home in the morning with a phone call, and I was so embarrassed, and I had to pick up trash on the freeway and all that stuff, and I was so self-centered. I thought people could tell who I was, you know, with the with the big goggles and the orange vest picking trash up on I-5 when they're zooming by at 80. But anyway, I was really embarrassed to be doing that, and I had to go to OHS classes and do all this stuff, and, and I... I understood what they were saying, but I wasn't really willing to give it up. I, I did while I was doing my freeway duty. I drank a lot of near beer. And it's like, that stuff's really filling. Anyway, I um, didn't really work, but I was trying to tell myself that I really was only drinking for the taste. I didn't want it to be the problem because she had the problem. My mom was an alcoholic. I didn't want to be like her. And so my drinking kept on going. And then when I had gotten away from that, that drug user, I had stopped using drugs, but my alcoholism just picked up even more. I was drinking more and more and more. And it was, it was causing me so much problems. And I, um, I totally believe in angels, and that's just me. But I had a spiritual experience when I got sober, and it was June 1st, 1985. And I was at my dining room table, and I was looking out the window, and I was, you know, up high on this piece of property. And the dining room window had a great view and everything, and I was looking out that window, and I was sobbing because I got so drunk, and I'd called him over, and, you know, him, the old drug user from the last place where I lived, and um, to rehash why he missed my birthday three years ago. <laughs> I was almost over that resentment. But anyway, so, you know, I went in and out of blackouts, and he was there, and I told him to leave, and I was crying, and I was trying to drink coffee and have a cigarette, and I'm looking out the window, and I finally saw that that moment of clarity, that moment of grace where I knew that I was a common denominator and all those pitiful and incomprehensible and demoralizing things that I had done when I was out there being an alcoholic woman that were because of me and alcohol. It wasn't his problem, wasn't my mom's, wasn't anybody's. It was me and alcohol. And I just said, God, help me. And he did. He picked me up from under my arms. And it wasn't like a scary thing. And it wasn't like jerked out of the chair, but I was just like just like hoisted up out of the chair and I could feel something physically under my arms and I went over to the kitchen counter and I grabbed the phone book and it was like an out of body thing even though I was in my body and I was like looking out my eyeballs and I watched my hand open the phone book and it, my finger stopped at the Alano Club and I thought the Alano Club was where that AA meeting was because two years before that my older sister had initiated intervention on my mom back in Ohio and they were going to Toledo and going to the Tennyson Center and doing all these prep 
weekly things with all my siblings and my dad behind my mom's back and um, gearing up to do an intervention and would I come home and do that. And I had to go to one AA meeting and that's where I went. I went to the Oceanside Lano Club and to this day I don't even remember how I found out that that's where it was. And when I went to that meeting, one of Cliff Roach's sponsees was the secretary and he was a young guy. And he, you know, after the meeting, he said, you didn't say you were an alcoholic. Because all I, I didn't even really pay attention to what they were saying, except he was young and pretty good looking. <laughs> I paid attention. Anyway, and then the, the first guy they shared was like, hi, I'm Fred. I'm an alcoholic. And I'm like chewing my cheek to keep from laughing. I'm like, oh, Fred doesn't know his name. Hi, Fred. All right, yo, Fred. Anyway, and so I'm just like, oh, my God. <laughs> Put my mom in here. <laughs> anyway, so I'm like judging. And so... I'm kind of missing the meeting, and afterwards he said, you didn't say you were an alcoholic, and I said, no, I just drink beer only, and you know, you have voice, and he's like, you liar, you drink anything, get your hands on, you know, you're trying to, you got this, and he's cute, you know, anyway, and so he goes, oh, and he's smiling, and he goes, oh, okay, and I said, I'm just here to do this intervention for my mom, and he goes, oh, okay, he goes, here, get I'm going to give you my phone number. Why don't you let me know when you get back how that went? And so I thought, oh, okay. And I thought he was hitting on me. <laughs> he was not. But anyway, and so I went back when we did this intervention, and it's like I had to go to all these classes every day for a week before it when my mom didn't know I was in town to prepare for it, to catch up for what they had been doing. And I found out that I was an alcoholic while I watched all these videos, and I had to go to an AA speaker and an Al-Anon speaker meeting and I related to everybody on every angle of this disease and I had already you know got my 502 and all this kind of stuff so I already saw some of the the effects in my own life and the counselor met with me and she goes so what do you think and I go I, I think I'm an alcoholic she goes you may be but we're only here for your mom and I'm like you got it only <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm, I'm totally on board with that and so anyway it wasn't she misunderstood. I didn't say I wanted to give it up. I was just aware. And so I was like, there's a, a gap like the Grand Canyon there. But anyway, so I, um, so it was weird because then when we did this surprise thing on my mom, um, we all took turns telling her what she ought to do about her alcoholism. And I felt like such a hypocrite because I wanted her to give it up so I'd get the mom back that I wanted, not given a damn that I wasn't the daughter that she might have wanted and about my alcoholism and I knew I was just like her but I wasn't about to give it up and my siblings were all married and they went home after that intervention with their spouses and my dad and I went back to the town that they're from got her clothes because she agreed to stay and took them to the hospital and then we went to the Elks Club and drank and we drank and drank and it's like I needed that so bad and it was like I'm sitting there slamming them down without couldn't get them in fast enough talking about the weather and who I should pick in the football pool and all that stuff knowing that I'm just a hypocrite I want her to do something but I wasn't about to do something myself and so my alcoholism just kept on progressing um, when I came back to California my mom was the first example that I was aware of at that time of someone who was sober and alcoholics anonymous because she came into the program and stayed for six months and was active and and got a sponsor and all those things things back in Ohio and I was in California but I called home every week then as I do now and it's like there was a difference in my mom it was like getting my mom back she was happy and laughing and my mom has a great sense of humor and all that stuff and um it helped but I didn't know that's probably where I knew to go to an AA meeting um when we did that intervention before but anyway so when I came to that day and I my finger stopped at the Alano Club, I called and Judy answered. She goes, hi, I'm Judy. I'm a happy alcoholic. And I'm like, whoa. You know, I got your head's wow, wow. You know what I mean? I'm like, Judy, <laughs> tone it down. <laughs> so I um, was like, you know, she was, and she was only about this tall and she ran like one of those sandpipers, you know, with her little legs, you know. What? She was, <laughs> she was a crack up. She worked at the coffee bar and you could tell. Anyway, she was, <laughs> she was, she was into it. Anyway, and she had regular and decaf, and she ran up and down the aisles, and you know, pouring it. Anyway, so I just kept my eye on her. She was quick, and so anyway, but she just pulled me in. She goes, "Can you come to a meeting right now?" And I'm so grateful she didn't say, "You're going to get here in time for the." second half and I don't want you to interrupt the meeting she didn't say that and I'm thankful because if she had said you wait until the tonight the meeting tonight I wouldn't have gone 
I would not have gone. And so I went right then, and she met me at the door, and she pulled me in. And it's like, you know, they say in the big book, to those now in its fold, to those now in its fold, in the middle, right in the middle of Alcoholics Anonymous, it's made the difference between life and death. And people like Judy have been pulling me into the fold for all my sobriety. And it's like, I'm so grateful to her. It's like, you know, it makes a difference when you take those calls, when you reach out to people. You don't know when that moment of grace is or how it's going to fade. And so anyway, she just pulled me in and got me, you know, they said, go to 90 meetings in 90 days and get commitments and keep them and, and get a sponsor and all this stuff. And it's like LMNOP. Everything was like, whatever. What's a GSR, H&I, you know? It's all Greek. But anyway, she was so great to me. And I could call her anytime because I wasn't sleeping much those first few weeks. And, and she didn't sponsor me but she was somebody that that I knew I could ask those questions and she wouldn't make fun of me and it, I was here a couple of weeks and I was going to a meeting every day and and calling my sponsor I got my sponsor the second well that meeting really I had her for a, about a month and then I switched sponsors but she helped me for a month and so anyway but I'd call up Judy and I'd say Judy you don't drink ever <laughs> I'm like not your your wedding day or Christmas <laughs> and she goes are you engaged I go no. She goes, well, we won't worry about that. And so, <laughs> all righty. And so <laughs> she goes, as far as Christmas, she goes, honey, it's June. <laughs> and we, <laughs> I was, I'm a thinker though. <laughs> anyway, and so she goes, we do this thing a day at a time. And she goes, besides, you can drink tomorrow unless you wake up tomorrow and it's today because we don't drink, drink today no matter what. Love you, bye. And I'm like, <laughs> But if you wake them up, that's what you get. You know what I mean? Anyway, and so so she would help me with stuff like that. And so I called her, and I just started getting active in the meeting. And my home group is the Carlsbad Thursday Night Workshop. And there's a couple hundred people there every week. And I'm coming off my my kitchen floor, living alone to this bright lights and happy people and big greeting lines and love and hugs and all this stuff. And part of me craved it. And I knew that I belonged and part of me was terrified. And I had a different sponsor after 30 days and she was a member of that group. And I felt like I was really taking a chance. And I admitted to her, I said, um, Mary, I'm, I'm afraid of people. And Cliff laughs at me and he goes, you knew people by their shoes. You only looked at the floor. <laughs> you wouldn't make eye contact with anybody and you'd flinch if somebody touched you. But I was so afraid that I wasn't going to make it here. You know, once I knew that I belonged, I didn't want to leave here. And another thing that Judy gave me that was so amazing, because if you're new, um, what Judy told me, because she said she got on her knees every single morning and asked God to remove the obsession and desire to drink. And that she got on her knees every night and thanked him for another day of sobriety. And she goes, you know what, Deb, if you don't believe in God, believe my God's big enough for the both of us. And it was like, so I got on my knees. I said, Judy's God, please remove the obsession and desire to drink. And I did that because I thought, you know, the way I was raised and I was taught right from wrong and I believed in it, that I was on a blacklist and that God didn't want to hear from me. And it was like, but Judy's God, she seems to be wound up, you know, <laughs> on fire about this guy. You can't see. But anyway, so I prayed. And after three days, I thought, I don't want her God. I want my own because this is working. And it's like I had thoughts of drinking, but I never had an obsession to drink. And I love that. And so I started doing that, and I started getting commitments at meetings. And when I told Mary that I was afraid of people, she goes, oh, you are? You're afraid? And I go, yeah. And she goes, you're a greeter. Come on, get to the door. And I'm like, oh, my God, she can't hear me. But the thing that was so neat was that she was the first person who taught me about taking actions opposite of how I felt. And that when I was afraid of people, I needed to get out of my self-centered fear and get to the door and start making other people feel welcome. And I had to get to my home group early and take those commitments. And what I found was that getting to know a few other greeters was easier than trying to walk into a meeting when it, the noise level was already loud. And I got there early when there were just a few people and I started making friends. And, and I realized you don't even have to talk to people because they talk so much about themselves. You just stand still. And so anyway, and so... I started feeling a part of, and the thing that was so neat was when I started greeting, all of a sudden I had this feeling inside about welcome to my meeting. This is my meeting too. And that's what commitments have done for me. All my sobriety has made me feel a part of. That loneliness and not a part of feeling that I had my whole life, I started getting when I started taking commitments. And then I started finding a power greater than myself here, and that made me have that sense of belonging wherever I went. Um, 
I started on my steps, and I knew I was alcoholic. I didn't think my life was quite unmanageable because, you know, the things I didn't lose, I had never had anyway. And so I am... Um, but I found out, you know, about the stuff on the inside and turning my will and my life over. I was so afraid that I wasn't going to do that right, that it was like some Billy Graham kind of thing. You get one crack at it. You got to do it right and really give it up. And I knew I wanted to. And she showed me in the 12 and 12 where it talks about all you need is the key of willingness. And that door open ever so slight, but, you know, self-will can slam it shut. But you just need the key of willingness and that. She said you need to get busy with your inventory and get rid of those things you swore you were never going to tell anybody and that you're as sick as your secrets, Deb. you got to get that stuff out. And so I did my inventory and, you know, I didn't do it the way it was in the big book the first time that I did my inventory. I've done lots of step work, you know, whether it's another fourth step or a thorough tenth or what, I, you know, tomato, tomato, I don't care. It's just willing to continue to take inventory. But when I did that the first time, it's kind of like more like a life story and telling all those things I swore I'd never tell anybody. But it was enough for me to make a start in this program and I didn't leave anything out. Later, I've had things be revealed to me and I got to clean those up. You know, we don't, we don't have to drink to start over. That's what I'm so thankful for. I've made mistakes and I've done sloppy work and whatever, but I haven't had to drink to start over. So I did that to the best of my ability, and I, I shared that inventory, and I didn't have a great experience. I personally had one with a lady who thought that I had already left to go home, and I was in the bathroom, and she was on the phone sharing my inventory with one of my sobriety sisters. But the thing that I learned from that was I thought nobody's going to drive me out of Alcoholics Anonymous. And it's like, that just taught me a lesson. She's not perfect. I'm not perfect, whatever. And it's, I'm good with that. It's just, that was a mistake that she probably never did again as well. But anyway, cause it, it hurts people. And so, and I wanted to trust somebody, you know, I love in the book where it says that we can share our inventory with anybody, a priest or family. We can do it with anybody, but I wanted to learn to trust somebody and I needed to have a sponsor that knew the past as well as who I am now and how I'm falling short now and what I'm trying to be. So I got another sponsor. I shared that same inventory and I had a different experience because she shared all kinds of stuff back with me. You know, one alcoholic talking to another and it was, we were on equal footing and it was a really good experience and I felt so defective. You know, um, to do six and seven, it's just such little paragraphs in the big book, but there's so much depth and weight to it that I was missing it, you know? And the thing that Jody did was she helped me by listening to my inventory. She took little notes and helped me label my defects, you know, because I didn't know, you know, how to put the greed and the sloth and the lust and all that. I mean, I knew lust. I got that and down. Anyway, so I had some of, you know, but she just helped me with that. And then she said, this is what you're going to kneel and pray the seven step prayer about. And then you're going to continue to do it. The 12 and 12 talks about it separates the men from the boys to continue to do that. And, and I've been struggling with stuff lately again at work. It's like that defects are on parade again. And it's in step seven, it talks about the chief activator of our defects is self-centered fear, either fear that we're going to lose something that we have or not get something that we demand. And I've been just riddled with fear about losing my job. The whole dynamics at work are really scary, and I'm intuitive, and I pick up on stuff, and, and then I think it's all about me, so I'm not sleeping good, which makes me more fearful the next day, and it's just it's nuts. Anyway, I realize that it's that kind of stuff, and I get critical and judgmental on my coworkers and how I think they ought to be, not minding my own business. <laughs> That's what my friend talked about, you know, that spiritual principle of mind your own business, you know, and it's sweeping my side of the street and that kind of stuff. And it's like that, the defects that go on parade at times to me, it's like that whack-a-mole thing. You know, you get one, you whack and two more pop up. And it's like, I, I understand that I have to give them to God and that I can't make my defects go away. And God does not remove the defects that I want to be removed. He removes the ones that prevent me from being a maximum service to him. And I guess the benefit from the things that I'm still plagued with, with years of recovery and a lot of effort, you know, maybe not best, but a lot of effort is that they keep me going to God. They keep me coming to meetings. They keep me right-sized when I realize, when I start thinking about what other people ought to be doing. I've got so much work to do right here, you know? And so 
I do that to the best of my ability, and I made my eight-step list, and that IV drug user was on there, and I, I told her about that, and she goes, you're amends to him, and stay out of his life, and I'm like, these aren't so bad. <laughs> you know, I'm a little list maker, love that, you know. <laughs> anyway, and so then, you know, I kind of hit the wall with the pay the money back stuff, but anyway, you know, but, and I found out that paying the money back wasn't the difficult ones. The ones that were the most difficult were the ongoing ones with my family, the living amends. And you can say you're sorry, and but to change your behavior and to allow their alcoholism to go one way and you're on a path of sobriety and the, the, the gap is further away. It's just been, it's been harder lately. It's been better. They're all back in Ohio, but, um, I feel I'm better, better footing with them, you know, love them where they're at and stop having expectations of if they get sober, then we'd be close and kumbaya and, you know, anyway, but, you know, I just love them right the way they are, you know, and so I, I made my amends. I had financial amends. I, I had stolen from this ice cream place that I worked at in Ohio and I saved up the money and I was told initially to pay that money anonymously to charity, and it was, um, she said it had to be the first check that was written, oh no, cashier's check or whatever one you don't have your name on, and pay that to charity, and so I did that, and I was making next to nothing when I got sober, and I did it that way, and I paid it all back with interest, and I took it off the list, but the thing was, that was one of them that never, I never felt clean on the inside. Every time I was at a step study, and people were talking about amends, I never felt clean with that one. And years later, I had Dr. Paul for my sponsor, and I told him about that. And he said, well, it's because you didn't pay it back to who you took it from. And that man was still alive, and so I saved up the money again. I was making more, thank God, and and got the interest and inflation, all that stuff. And I had an envelope of money, and I was back in Ohio, and I called from a phone booth. And his wife answered, and I said, I don't know if you remember me, because it had been like 20 years and since I worked there as a teenager. And she goes, oh, yeah. And I'm like, <laughs> you know, I'm like, and I go, can I come and talk to you guys for a minute? So I went to their house, and these people were really nice to me, this husband and wife, and they took me kayaking and all this kind of stuff. They were really good to all of us teenagers there. And I said, I don't know if you knew that I stole from you, but I wasn't raised that way, and I'm here to pay the money back. And he goes, you don't have to pay that back. And I said, said, it's not my money, it's yours. And he goes, oh, Deb, he goes, the 60s and 70s were rough on everybody. <laughs> I'm like, thank you. <laughs> thank you. It was like, totally took the stress away. And they were so kind and loving, and I just gave them the envelope, and it was just a beautiful experience. And, and we wrote back and forth at Christmas for a few years, and I've lost touch. But he said, I don't know if you know, but I just sold the ice cream place, and, and um I have cancer. And so it was just a beautiful, the timing and everything was really neat. And that's what I mean about you don't have to drink to start over. That immense had been sitting and it was done maybe wrong, but maybe it was right at the time. Who knows? But anyway, so I cleaned that up and I had um, amends to make to friends. And one of them said, oh, that's fine. Don't worry about it. Let's just have a couple. <laughs> I'm like, no, I don't drink at all. It's not about pacing myself. And so anyway, but I didn't drive their kids drunk anymore. I stayed sober and um, that kind of stuff. And, and I've gone on to do, you know, 10, 11, and 12 to the best of my ability. And it's like I, for several years, I mean, I always get up early and I do my quiet time. I do different readings and prayers and stuff. And I, I keep a little list. And when I tell somebody at a meeting, you know, I'll, I'll be praying for your daughter or I'm praying for you for losing your house or, you know, hope that you get a job or whatever. I go home and I write them on my list. I mean, I keep a list and I pray for these people in the morning and I pray for the people that I resent. Sometimes the list gets too long. Anyway, so I, um, you know, but I was taught that if you resent somebody to pray for them every day for two weeks for everything you want for yourself. And that does set me free. And I've done that repeatedly. And my boss has stayed on there ad infinitum, <laughs> but, but as much as as grounded <laughs> anyway, but I, um, and so I do that kind of stuff, and I say my prayers. And I, several years into sobriety, I, I took a formal meditation class, and it really helped me. Um, it was a German lady, and it was a TM class because I wanted to help learn how to really meditate. And I was trying to explain to her that I was an alcoholic, and then I have a busy mind, and she goes, oh, that's just your ego. <laughs> she goes, I tell my ego, I love you very much. I'll give you my undivided attention in 20 minutes. <laughs> I'm like, all right, I can, I like this lady. 
<laughs> she's like, so I learned to sit still, and I, you know, and it's busy, and why didn't you remember to get pickle relish at this, you know, whatever it's telling me, and then I sit quiet, and then it's like, you know, why, you didn't return that call, and then I get quiet, and I keep doing the mantra over and over, and sometime in the 20 minutes, all of a sudden, I get quiet and I get quiet, and it helps me. And what it does for me during the day is it stretches out my day. I can go like a maniac, and I'm type A, and I'm a little bit like that little Judy, you know, running around. But it helps me to be much more productive. You know, the book talks about we don't tire so easily because we're not running around burning up energy foolishly as we did when we were trying to arrange life to suit ourselves. And it's like it really does work. It just helps strengthen me and it helps me to pause when agitated and it helps me to remember all those things and so I try and do that um, I don't meditate every single morning but most mornings and so that's helping and um, and I sponsor people and I take 12-step calls and and I love 12-step calls I started sponsoring at a year of sobriety I was taught you, you can be a taker for a year but after that, you need to get busy and start giving it away. And I started doing H&I, and I got a sponsee, and she was the first sponsee that I ever had, and her name was Grace, and it was beautiful. And she was older than me, and she was from Europe, and I would call her up, and every day, you know, call me, we're going to go to 90 minutes and 90 days, and I'm picking her up and driving her all over. And I called her up. I said, Grace, I'm on my way. She goes, no. You are frenetic. And I go, I'm like, oh my God. She goes, I'm going to drink my vine. Click. And I'm like, ah. I'm like, so angry. You're making me look bad, Grace. And so anyway, because I was like all about me. Anyway, and so that was my experience with sponsoring. And then I just got busy and got another sponsee and just started giving it away. And my sponsor taught me it's not about the outcome. It's about the willingness and to keep doing the footwork and, and try and give away what was freely given to you. And I sponsor people, and I love doing that. And I share at meetings when asked. And, and I had so many beautiful experiences in this program and I've had a lot of heartache too because I had I had this list of how my life was going to unfold and um, I heard this speaker early in sobriety say if she would have made a list she would have shortchanged herself and I thought pathetic <laughs> I'm a list maker <laughs> I'm not going to shortchange myself so I went home and I wrote this big list and I still have it in my big book today and it's I wanted a husband and kids I wanted six kids. I wanted, you know, three sets of twins if possible, quickly, you know, lots quickly. Anyway, and so, and then I wanted a house, and I wanted to go to Europe, and I wanted to go to Alaska, and I wanted to pass, uh, get my degree in land surveying and pass the LSIT and LS exams for those surveyor things. And, and it's like I only have a couple of things on that list, you know, but I realized after many years in the program that what that list really is is a list of my old ideas of what I thought was going to make me happy. And every single one of them is things on the outside. None of those are peace of mind, you know, comprehend serenity. I didn't think those were really big deals in early sobriety. They'd say, oh, the promise is <laughs> we'll, we'll know peace and, you know, and I'm Oh, brother, how about a husband? Anyway, so <laughs> I kept that to myself. But anyway, so, but, you know, I'm like, <laughs> woo-wee. <laughs> so, but now I get it, you know. Now I know that's priceless. But anyway, so, you know, those kind of things are things nobody can take away. That's what I love about the list now. Those are the things in the big book that nobody can take away. And they're not based on outside circumstances. And that's what's been great because I've had good times and bad. And I got fired in sobriety. And I'd been with that engineering firm for 10 years. And I was just falling apart. And I went to a meeting the next day. And they told me to go home and read page 449 and put on a dress and go apply places. So I went to two different places. Both of them offered me a job. Then I'm like, which one's God's will? Which one? You know, and they said, if you will end up wherever God wants you. So, and you can't make a mistake. So I picked one and it was a, it was a, full-time job with benefits and stuff, and I liked the security of that, and I worked there for a year. And then the other job that had offered me a position as a contract employee for one year, it became a permanent job with benefits, and I went there a year later. But at that one firm, I got to 12-step somebody in, in that year, so there was no mistake that I was to pick that job. And then I went to the other one, and I was there for 12 years, and they had great benefits and medical and that engineering firm that I was never, ever going to leave, I was going to die there. <laughs> I am, um, until they fired me, of course. And so I am, um, <laughs> but they never gave me not one day a sick time after 10 years. And when I had about nine years of sobriety, um, 
I got sick. Actually, I'll back up a minute. One of the things on my list was to go to Europe. And so I had lived in Nuremberg, Germany for two and a half years when I was a kid. My dad was an accountant and we went there. It was supposed to be a year and it ended up two and a half and it was great. And so when I had about nine years of sobriety, I wanted to go to Oh, no, when I had seven years, I wanted to go to Europe. So I went to England and Scotland because I thought they speak the same language, you know, roughly. <laughs> anyway, and so, like, if you throw marbles in your mouth, it's the same. Anyway, so... <laughs> So I went to England and Scotland, and this lady from my home group, I kid you not, she goes, you're going alone, not with a tour group? And I go, no, I want to do it a day at a time on my own. She goes, there's pickpockets in England. And I'm like, wow. You know, and then I thought, well, I worked in Oceanside. <laughs> we have scabbers. <laughs> but anyway, I didn't think that far. So then I was all afraid, and that was a few months out. And so I went to my Monday night book study, and this old guy comes there and he was from Bristol, England and we became pen pals and I told him I was coming to England and I, I wrote him and I didn't say anything about the pickpockets they have but anyway, I told him that I was a bit afraid and he wrote back, he said God lives this side of the pond and he said, so just um, would you be willing to go to a meeting on your third day in London in Chelsea with me and we'll go to dinner and would you speak at my home group in Bristol on your last night and I had two AA commitments in a country I hadn't been to and I was short up and it was so neat because I didn't know anybody in the in the whole country and so I got there and I went to a meeting my first night in London and you guys taught me to get there early and help out what can you add to the meeting so I got there early and I'm a tea drinker and they make these big pots of tea so I'm in the kitchen helping the ladies make tea and all of a sudden this church just fills up and I go back in and I take my seat and the tea lady comes to the end of the aisle and she goes come to so I'm like and they go back out, and she goes, mind your wallet, love, the man next to you is a pickpocket. <laughs> what the <laughs> hell? I go back in, and I sit down. <laughs> oh, God. I'm like, I've been in this country about 11 hours. And I'm like, <laughs> there he is, right next to me. And so he was, he was a homeless man. And so I shook his hand, and I just sat there, and I welled up because... What happened was I knew I was no different than him. And then I was a thief, too, and I stole from the ice cream place. And that we were no different in God's eyes. And that if he stayed here, he wouldn't be a pickpocket anymore. And I wouldn't be a thief anymore. And she looked out for me, and I can welcome him. And it was just a beautiful experience. And I did that whole trip a day at a time. And I love golf, so I went to St. Andrews. And I'm driving on the other side of the road. And I'm all over the place. I kept getting lost in this one town. And, you know, those roundabouts are tricky little things. Anyway, and so I kept <laughs> ending up in the same. There's sheep in the road. And my, my motto is you can't get lost if you don't know where you're going. <laughs> <laughs> get out of the way <laughs> shifted with my left hand but I was crying because I was like you know I'm blasting Phantom of the Opera because I got to see that in London and, and I realized at seven years of sobriety because you taught me to get busy and go to meetings and call and sponsor and all this stuff that I was so busy and so type A that I'm over there and I'm completely by myself and I'm by myself in this rent a car, but I realized I was not alone and that I had tapped an unsuspected inner resource by doing all that work and all those commitments and all those phone calls that I had the great reality deep within. And that's why I can go anywhere and I'm not alone because I have the great reality deep within. And I can block that off with resentments. I can block it off with a drink. I can block block it off with fear, but you give me the tools over and over again to get rid of all that stuff. And I came back and I kept on going with my life and the list was not unfolding. You know, God's slow because he's old. But anyway, I'm like, uh, wow, I'm going to have to pace myself and readjust. So I'm going back to Europe <laughs> alone. And so I went to Germany this time before I went, I passed out on the floor in my bathroom and I got up and I was dizzy and blacked out on the floor again. And so I went to the doctor and they did blood tests and they said, you're really anemic. So you're going to have to be careful on this trip. And I was careful, but I didn't feel good. And then I got in a car accident in the black forest and off to the hospital in an ambulance. It was just a rough trip, but it was beautiful to be where I was you know, where I lived for two and a half years as a kid. It was beautiful. And I came back and they did test to see if I was still anemic and they found out that I had a rare platelet disease where my body was attacking itself. And so for 11 years, I was on and off steroids and jacked up and angry and up in the middle of the night with two and a half to five hours sleep a night. And I'm angry and I'm alphabetizing my spices like a tweaker, you know, and I'm like wanting to stab myself with steak knives. It was lovely. <laughs> and so anyway, 
But the thing is, it's like that was really hard times, you know, working full time and trying to go to meetings. And I had to give up some of my commitments. And I was terrified because it was a fine line between taking care of my health and not wanting to give up what I had here. And so I had to learn the balance by, you know, over committing and not being able to keep commitments and dealing with medical. And the thing that I got out of that was um, years of mistake thinking because what happened was people would say well your faith will make you well and I'd pray and I'd say please heal me and please give me more platelets and I was getting my platelets done every week and and when my counts would go up I'd be thanking God and when they go down I'd think he didn't care and I, I had this thing going where my faith was tied to my platelet counts and that that just about did me in and I had to get to a place and I hit like a surrender where I started thanking him whether the counts went up or down thank you for healing me and it's like after 11 years then they took my spleen out and it worked for me and it made me well and I was well for five years and then just last year it came back and so then they had to go do more tests they found out I grew another spleen I think go figure <laughs> My, my friend goes, oh, Debbie G, always the overachiever. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> I'm growing new organs. Get out of there. <laughs> so, the anesthesiologist goes, what are we doing today? <laughs> I said, getting a second spleen. He goes, we were all looking at the surgery board. What are we doing? <laughs> I'm like, don't, don't tell me that before you put me under. You don't know what you're doing. Anyway, so took it out full of platelets again and so you know what it's a day at a time that's what I had to learn is that it doesn't matter the life circumstances are really good at times and not so good other times and I you know was able to buy a house a couple years ago on my own it's, it took me 20 years to save to get a house down there and and I've been able to you know play golf and go fishing for fish you know <laughs> really cool things anyway and do, and be able to do fun things and be there with sponsees when they have kids and all that other stuff and I just want to end with with a really cool story that helped spark my faith when those times were the gray days. And I used to struggle with that, you know, and Dr. Paul used to tell me that even, even priests, he said, Deb, write, write books about the gray days because that's what life is, mainly gray days. You don't get all these, you know, get married days or, you know, win the lottery or buy a house or whatever. Most of them are just day-to-day -day things where you just find God in the little ways. And I started doing that and looking for the miracles and, and being a part of people's lives and having people trust me to do their inventories and stuff is just really a privilege. And so I love doing that. And I, um, I found out at, um, about seven years of sobriety, that my grandpa had been in Alcoholics Anonymous in 1947. For some reason, there was this thing on the news about, I think it was when they had that first thing about they might come out with a pill, you know, and all that stuff. And so I was talking to my mom, and I go, because we don't talk about AA or alcoholism much because she had gone back out and, and to this day. But anyway, so I was telling her, I go, gosh, you and I are the only alcoholics. I mean, in the family, she goes, well, no, grandpa was an alcoholic and got sober in 1947. And he had passed away um, a few months before I got sober. And I don't know if he was my angel that day or not. But anyway, um, I think he is. But anyway, it doesn't matter. So I called my grandma because I didn't know that. And we started talking, and she sent me his first edition big book and the original Little Red book and all this stuff, and it was so cool. And it's like I um, I got to speak at the South Bay Roundup, and I got to be the opening speaker at that conference in Torrance. And there's like 3,000 people, and all these people, and, and the guy sitting right next to me was Roger Daniels. And he led that meeting because he used to live there, and he, he and his wife live in New Mexico. And he was in town to lead that meeting like he does every year. And I shared about my grandpa getting sober in Michigan in 1947. And so at the Saturday night meeting, he pulls me aside and he goes, I want to know about your grandpa because my uncle got sober in Michigan around the same time. Maybe they knew each other. And I'm like, yeah, that'd be great. And I'm thinking, the mitten is big. Anyway, but anyway, <laughs> sure they knew each other. And so anyway, so, so he goes, what town was your grandpa from? And I said this little tiny town outside of Jackson, Michigan. I said, it's called Vandercook Lake. He goes, that's where my uncle's from. And I'm like, wow, that's pretty cool, you know. And so he goes, is your grandma still alive? And I go, well, yeah. And he goes, call her and ask her if, if she remembers my uncle. And I said, what's his name? And he, he said, Roy Drinkwine. I'm like, oh, that's so cool. I'm like, I, I want to be Doobie Drink Beer. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> 
oh, I come back as an Indian. <laughs> it was so cool. So I went, I went home from the conference. I called my grandma. She had had open heart surgery and was home and doing better. And I go, sorry about your heart, grandma. But by the way, <laughs> do you remember a man by the name of Roy Drinkwine? She hesitated for about half a second. And she goes, well, yeah. Roy and Frida drink wine lived one street over on McDevitt. She goes, honey, when your grandpa's drinking got so bad that I threw him out of the house, Roy drink wine was the man who carried the message to your grandpa. And it's like, oh my God, I'm like, I love you, bye. Click. I'm like, dial Roger. Yeah. <laughs> bye bye now. <laughs> I call Roger and Annie up and I go, Roger, we're related. And we both were crying like babies. And it was so beautiful, you know, those little God shots or those big cod shots. And it's like, I'm so grateful, you know, because my grandpa was sober doesn't guarantee me sobriety. It's a daily reprieve based on the condition of my spiritual experience. And you guys help my spiritual experience. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.